Hey, what's up? Welcome back to my channel where we create apps with Flutter from scratch. In this one, I'm going to show you how to code the game Tetris. And we're not going to use any third party packages or anything. We're going to use purely Flutter and Dart to code this game up. And it's really fun actually, so let me show you by jumping into the code. So I've opened up a brand new Flutter project and you should just get this demo homepage which is just this counter app. Now I'm gonna delete everything below the main function so that we can completely start this from scratch. So in our material app, let's go to our game board, which we are going to create right now. Let's just call it board.dart. And let's create here a stateful widget called game board. And make sure to come back to your main.dart file and import what we just created. And if you save it, then we should just get this blank scaffold. So this is just where we're going to begin. Now for the background color, I want to make it kind of like an arcade game. So let's make it black. And for the grid dimensions, let's store some integers here. So the row I want 10 and in the column I want 15. So using these numbers, let's create a grid, which if you need help on this, I've made a separate tutorial covering grid views specifically. So make sure to check that out if you need, but I can show you how to create a grid real quick here. So for the cross axis count, we want the row length and the item builder. So in each grid for now, just to show you how this works, I wanna show you in the center, let's create a quick text widget to display the index. And we might not be able to see it because the text is black. So let's just make that white real quick. And so you can see this is how the grid works. It starts from zero at the top left and just goes zero, one, two, three, moving to the right. And so that's what this index is telling us about. Now we didn't specify an item count. So it's just printing an infinite number. So how many do we want to print? Well, row times column. So that's 150 right there. Now, another thing you can do is looks like this is kind of scrollable right now. So under the grid, you can say in the physics, you can make it never scrollable, which is going to be good for our game. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my library. I'm going to create a new file called pixel.dart. And this will just represent each square that you see in place of the number. Okay, so it's just going to be a very basic container, but let's pass through a color. Okay, so now if I come back to my grid, I can create this pixel and I can give it a color. Now it looks like there's no margin padding around any of these grids. So let's come back to the pixel.dart file and add in a little margin. Cool. And also let's make it curved on the border radius, which is always a good idea. Cool. So for a blank pixel, let's make it gray with a strength of 900. And we can get rid of this center now. And in the pixel, you know what? It might be a good idea actually just to continue displaying the numbers so that it's easier for us to work with. So in the pixel, I'm going to also include a child. And this is just to display that text widget from before. Okay, so now you have a red squiggle because we have to fill in the child as well. Cool, so let's just have these numbers on here just while we work out this Tetris game. Now the main important part of this tutorial is this piece.dart file. Now just before we do that, I'm going to create another file called values, just to have the sort of constants and the common uh, values throughout the app. Okay, now the main thing is I'm going to create an enum, which just means we want to create a few different types of tetramino pieces. So tetramino is just the different Tetris pieces that you can get. So you can have an L shape, a J shape, I, O, S, uh, Z, and a T. And just for your own visual, I put in this comment, right? So these are what the shapes look like, right? So you got the L, you got the J, I, O, S, C, and T. Sweet, so now let's create our piece class. And we're going to need to know what the type of this piece is. And if you really think about it, the piece is just going to be a list of integers. It's just going to be a list of numbers. Okay, we'll call that position. 
And then once we know what the type is, let's generate the integers. Okay, so I'm going to create a method here just called initialize piece. Now it depends on what the type is going to be, right? So let's just say for the first example, if the type is the L piece, then let's have a look at an L piece. So it could be something like these, right? 4, 14, 24, 25. So just to give you an idea on how we're going to create these pieces, let's come back to the board and let's create the current Tetris piece. Okay, let's start with L. Sweet, and so when this game starts up, in the initial state, let's also start the game. And in the start game, we just need to initialize the piece. Okay, so once we know the type, we have to call this initialize piece method to assign a position to that piece. Okay, so now that we've got that, let's say if current piece dot position contains the index, then I'm going to return a different colored pixel, let's say yellow. And otherwise, it's just going to be a blank pixel. So if I just save this and I rerun it, you can see there's our L shape. So using these numbers, this is how we're going to move around the board and also create different pieces. Now, before we move forward, let's go back to our values.dart file and I'm gonna create another enum, but for directions. So our piece can move left, right, and also down. Okay, and now let's create our moving piece method. So as long as we have a parameter and we know what the, what the direction is, let's say, the first case is if it goes down. What we're gonna do is we're gonna do a quick for loop and go through all of the integers in our position list. And we're just gonna add a row length, right? If you add a row length, that means you're gonna go down. Cool, now it looks like I want to access that row length variable, but it's within the board class. So I'm just gonna separate that out into the values.dart file so that my entire app can access it. Cool, so like I said before, if you add an entire row, it's just gonna go down. Cool, so now we're here. Let's fill out the left and the right as well, since it's quite similar, except moving left means we're just gonna subtract one, and moving right, we're going to add one. So if you have any problem understanding what we just did, just let me know in the comments below, and I'll try to come around and help. When we initialize the state and we start the game, we are going to now need to create a bit of a game loop. So we need a frame rate. Okay, so what that means is we're going to pick a duration. So let's say 400 milliseconds, and that's basically the speed of the game. Okay, so if I just create our game loop right underneath. Okay, so give, given a frame rate, let's use a timer, which you're going to have to import. I've used timers many, many times in the past. But what it essentially does is every 400 milliseconds, it's going to execute this bit of code. Right, so every 400 milliseconds, let's move the piece down. Right, and there it is. And you can see without any, <laughs> without any further code, it's just gonna continue going down below the, b below the ground. So you can see there how the 400, like if I change it to 800, it should be much slower. So you can control the game speed using this frame rate number. Cool, now one thing I just wanna say is, you see how the numbers that we assigned for the L piece for the position, they're all positive numbers, right? So they actually start at the top of the screen, but I actually want the pieces to begin above the screen. So I want like negative numbers so that it has this feeling of like falling down as opposed to just magically appearing at the top. So I'm just gonna subtract a couple of rows here and it should be the same position but a little bit higher up so that it's above the screen let's just check this out yeah that's the feeling i want so you see how it just falls from off the screen at the top so using these numbers we can create all of the other pieces which i already have done so let's just go one by one and let's make sure it all works so just starting with the j i'm going to come back and change it to j and it looks like j is working fine Let's do I.
I is working fine, let's do O. O is working fine, and let's fill it out for the S and the Z and the T as well. Cool, everything's good. Now, what we need to do now is to make this land. So you can see it just keeps falling through the ground. So we're going to need a bit of collision detection. And just to be clear, let's return true if there is a collision and return false if there is no collision. And we're going to require one parameter, which is the direction, so that we know what the future position is going to be. So let's put a lot of comments so that we know what's going on. So the first thing is I want to loop through each position of the current piece. And let's calculate the row and the column of the current position. Now this bit of the code I thought might require a little bit of extra explanation for you. So I brought out my iPad. now. If you look at this grid, if I think about this in terms of rows and columns, like a two by two matrix, then if you look at, for example, the very first square, like number zero, that one is in the row zero as well as the column number zero, right? And similarly, if you look at, say, for example, number eight, in terms of rows and columns, it's still row number zero and column is number eight, right? So what if we want to know the row and column of a random position, say like this one? I can see that the position is 25. And if we sort of visually use our brain to, you know, look at this and see what the row and column of position 25 would be, what would it be? So let's say starting from the row, that's row 0, row 1, row 2. Right, so 0, 1, 2. So it's in row number 2. And for the column, we have column 0, column 1, column 2, column 3, column 4, and column 5. Okay, so for this particular number 25, we have the row being 2 and the column being 5. So I want a nice little bit of code that takes in a position and spits out the row and column for that position. So let's have a look at this. Integer row is equal to position divided by row length. And we're going to get the floor. And the floor basically tells us the bottom integer. So I'll explain what that means. So for us, let's say 25 is our position and row length was 10. So 25 divided by 10 is 2.5. And the floor of that, so if you were to sort of round normally in math, this should round up to three, but floor tells us about the bottom number. So this will round down to two. Okay, so this code works to generate what the row would be. Now, what about for the column? Let's say position and the percentage sign. So if you don't know what the percentage sign is, it's basically the remainder symbol. 25 remainder 10 is five. So take out as many tens as you can, we are left with just five, and that's the column. So basically, all this to say, these two lines of code, we're going to use a couple of times throughout this video. So just know what this is actually doing. It's telling us the row and the column given a particular position. Let's get the current position, and let's divide it by the row length. And we're going to specifically get the floor. And if you hover over this, you can see what the floor does. It will basically get the bottom integer. And column is the current position, remainder of the row length. And so now since we know the direction, let's adjust the row and column based on the direction. Okay, so if we're going left, then let's adjust the column to the left by one. If it's right, let's adjust to the right by one. 
And if it's down, we're going to adjust the row by one. So we're going to use this to check if the piece is out of bounds. So let me go through what I just typed out. So you see this first one, the row is greater or equal to the column length. That is checking if we are either too low. And then the next one, column is smaller than zero. That is checking if, we're, if we are too far to the left. And column being greater or equal to the row length is too far to the right. Okay, so if any of those conditions are true, then the piece is out of bounds. And at this point, if no collisions are detected, then let's just return false. And this should actually be outside of the for loop. Cool, so now that we have this nice method, let's create one more called check landing. So if going down is occupied, then let's mark the position as occupied on the game board. So if I do a quick for loop through the position of the current piece, and we do that similar bit of code just to get the row and the column. Now I'm actually gonna to come to the very top and I'm just gonna put in some comments here saying game board, this is a two by two grid with null representing an empty space. A non-empty space will have the color in it to represent the landed pieces. So this is sort of the data structure. And so the first thing is to create the game board, which is going to be a two by two grid. So a list inside of a list. Okay, and each position is gonna have null at the beginning. Sweet, so now that we have this game board, this will help us keep track of the landed pieces. And we're gonna put in the current pieces type. And then, so once we've landed, then we're going to create a new piece. Okay, which we'll fill out in just a second. So if I come back to my game loop, every frame let's also check now for the landing and looks like it's sort of working but not really okay so when we create the new piece let's first create a random type so that we can create a random tetris piece each time okay so let's first of all let's get the tetramino type and just put in a random integer. And so we can now say the current piece is a new piece and the type is just the random type. And let's initialize it. So once it lands, so it looks like it's currently working, but we actually don't have the colors for the landed pieces. Like if I come back to my UI, if I just put some comments here just to make this clearer, this first part was to show the current piece so you can see it's in yellow. And then everything else, we have a blank pixel, which is gray. So we should have one for the landed pieces as well. That means we're going to check the game board, which means we're going to need to know the row and column. So let's grab that bit of code before. And we're going to check the row and column of the game board. And if it's not null, meaning there is a landed position in there, let's return a pixel and let's just say like pink. And you can see that there it is already, but let's just try this again. Yep. So it'll land. And then it's landing on top of the other pieces. Perfect. Great. So now that reminds me, we should bring in the colors. So I'm just gonna copy this in, you guys can copy it. So for all of the different types, I specified a color for it. You can obviously customize this to your own colors if you want. So if I come back to my piece class, let's incorporate the color.
Okay, if for some reason it's null, then we're going to return white. Okay, so coming back to my UI, let's get the tetramino type from the game board. So that's why we stored the type in the game board earlier. Because we can now display the right color for that position. So yellow will land and okay. So it's actually working, but the beginning one we should also change. Okay, so you can see the T is going to be a purple. You got that J to be blue and so on. So yay, this is pretty much Tetris. Okay, now let's add in some controls. So I'm going to wrap this in a column which means if you've had any experience with grid views and list views, you're going to need to wrap it in an expanded widget to specify the height. And so at the bottom of this column, I want to put some game controls. Okay, so going left, right, and rotate button. So let's quickly create those methods, moving left, right, and rotating. I can't see the color. Let's change it up to white. There it is. Let's space this out. And let's add some padding to the bottom. Cool. So if I click on these buttons, we can trigger these methods. So if you come back to the piece class, we already actually implemented the moving part, right? So we also have the check collision. So now we just need to say, okay, make sure the piece, make sure the move is valid before we move there. So we can check the collision. So if there isn't a collision, that's why we've got the exclamation mark at the front, then we can move. Okay, so same thing for the moving right. So let's check this. Yay, and you can see it's not you can see it's not going through the walls. And so yeah, everything is working fine, even the landing. Okay, which brings us to the rotating button. So the rotating requires a little bit of work, but I'll show you the fundamental part of how I coded it up. Okay, so basically we are going to rotate clockwise and we're gonna keep track of the rotation state, which is just an integer. And there should be four rotation states. So you can move clockwise four times, right? So I'm going to show you using a switch and case statement. So the first type, the first case is going to be the L. It's kind of like a nested switch case statement. The first switch, which uh, takes care of the type of piece. And then each type of piece has four rotation states for itself. Okay, so for me, I like to keep everything nice and visual just to make it a bit easier to see. So this first L, for this case number zero is going to look like the upright L. Now let me grab my iPad again and sort of explain a little bit more detail how we can pivot or rotate one of these pieces. So I've got the L here and I've got a particular rotation state. So if you understand this one case, then you should, you should be able to understand all of the other situations. So if you remember how we set this up, these pieces are essentially just a list of integers, right? They're just a list of numbers. So for example, the one on the left hand side, the position is going to look something like this, say 5, 13, 14, 15. And one thing to note is it's in ascending order. So that 5 is this 5 here, 13 is this guy, 14 is this one, and 15 is that last one there. And the other thing we know from lists is the index of each of these positions are 0, 1, 2, and 3, right? So using these numbers on the diagram, it's going to be 0, 1, 2, 3. And so when we rotate this piece clockwise, the main important thing to note is to choose a pivot. Okay, so I'm going to choose number 1, and we're just going to rotate around this piece. Okay, so if I just kind of overlap it, it should rotate into this new L. 
So that means the pivot, which is number one, is going to remain the same value. And all the other pieces, we're just going to do it relative to the pivot. So that very top part is just the pivot minus the row length. The bottom left is going to be adding a row length. And then the bottom right is going to be adding a row length and also adding one. So hopefully that makes sense. Let me know again in the comments if you need any help in understanding this. And so our new position is, if I just write it out one more time, is going to be something like this. Okay, and this is what you're going to see in the code when I show you. And we can assign the new position. Okay, so just to put some comments here, so we can get the new position and then we can update the position and also update the rotation state. So we're just gonna increment it by one and also just get the remainder of four because just in case the number becomes too big. Cool, so with this idea, I'm going to copy in the other three cases and I'm just gonna explain them and show you. Okay, so this is number case zero and then case one, case two, and then case three. So you've got these four different cases that it can rotate to. So if you look at this, uh, coming back to the rotate piece, if I click on the rotate, then let's set the state and call that method. And if we test it out, you can see it works for the L, perfect. Now one problem that you'll face is if you rotate at the end of a row, so if you go right up against the wall and then you rotate, then it will go through the wall, which is not what we want. Which means I need to have a, another method to check the valid position. So for this one, I'm just going to accept one integer, one number at a time, and just check if that is a valid position. So let's get the row and the column. And if the position is taken, let's return false. So if we go to the game board and we check the row and column, and if it's not null, then let's return false. And if we get to the end, then the position is valid. So let's return true. Cool, so we're gonna make one more similar method, but for this one, it's going to accept the piece position. So this will be a list of integers as opposed to the previous one, it's just accepting one integer. And so right now we're trying to make sure that it doesn't go through, like it doesn't rotate through the walls. So we have a couple of booleans, the first column occupied and the last column occupied. And we're going to do a for loop to go through each of the integers in the piece position. And let's return false if any position is already taken. Let's also get the column of the position. And we're gonna check. So if the column is equal to zero, then it's in the first column. And if it's in the last column, the row length minus one, if both of these are true, so if there is a piece in the first and last column, then that means it's going through the wall, right? So we don't want that to happen. So if you come back to where it updates the position in the rotation, now that we have this nice method, let's just put it in an if statement. Okay, so we're going to check the new position and just make sure it's a, uh, it's a valid position. Cool, so I'm just gonna go through and update the for the other cases. And so if you try it now, it won't go through the wall. So everything is working as, as planned. Now for all of the other pieces, there are so many. So there are in total six or seven pieces that have four rotations each. So I'm just gonna copy that part in since I showed you the first example and we can kind of go through each of them and you can copy and you can copy the code if you like so
We already went through the L. And the J, that's what this J should look like. And the I and the O, the O actually has no rotations. So there's, it's not actually executing any bit of code here at all. The S, the Z, and the T is the last one. So these are the rotations for all of the different pieces. So if you put that code in, then it should all work. And yeah, it's also landing as well. Which means that one of the last things we need to do is to clear the lines, right? If we have a full line on the bottom, we need to be able to clear it. So let's come back to the board and I'm going to create the clear lines method. So let's comment this out just to make it clear what we're doing. So step one, let's loop through each row of the game board from bottom to top. Okay, so we're going to go from the bottom and go row minus minus to go to the top. Step two is initialize a variable to track if the row is full. So let's initialize the Boolean row is full. And step three, so check if the row is full, which means all columns in the row are filled with pieces. So we're going to do a, another for loop inside here. And we're going to go through each column of this particular row. And if it's null, if there's any empty piece at all, then that means we can just return false and break out of the loop. Right, otherwise, if it goes through that entire for loop, then that means the row is full. So that's step four. We can now clear the row and shift the rows down. So we need to move all of the rows above the cleared row by one position. Okay, so let's just copy the above row to the current row. And step six is set the top row to empty. And step seven is to increase the score. So if we clear a line, that means we increase the score. So we should actually create that variable at the top. So integer current score is gonna be zero then we're going to increment it. So let's also display the score in the UI. So maybe above the game control. And let's make it white. And maybe add some padding. Okay, so if you come back to the game loop, we can clear the lines before we check the landing. So let's test this out. Yay, so it clears a line and you can see the score was incremented by one as well. So everything is working fine. If you have any questions about any of the code, just comment below and we can have a conversation there. Which means we now need a game over method. So let's create this Boolean and a game over method is we just need to check if any of the columns in the top row are filled. Okay, so if I do a quick for loop, let's check in the game board, starting at number zero, so that's just gonna be the top row, and any column in that top row, if it's not null, then we can return true, right? And if it goes through this entire for loop, then that means we can return false because none of the rows in the top are empty. Now, there's a very important detail when executing this game over function, which is, I'll just put the comments here. When we create a new piece, that's when I want to check the game over function, as opposed to checking the game over function in the game loop. So what I mean is, instead of checking every frame, we're going to check only when a new piece is created. The reason why we're not checking every frame is because we're still allowed to pass through the top row, but it just can't be occupied 
when the new piece is created. So hopefully I made that clear, but I'll just put the comment here, right? So since our game over condition is if there is a piece at the top level, you wanna check if the game is over when you create a new piece instead of checking every frame because new pieces are allowed to still go through the top level. But if there is already a piece in the top level when a new piece is created, then that's game over. So just comment below if that didn't make sense, but we can now check if the game is over and we should also store this in a separate variable. And just update it in this method. And then let's actually minimize all of these methods to make it clearer. In the game loop, we can just check every frame if the game is over or not. Then we can cancel the timer. And let's also show a game over message dialog. So I'm just gonna show an alert dialog here that says game over and maybe we can just tell them the score. And we also wanna create an action here. So let's create a button to play the game again. So let's create a reset game method. And also I also wanna pop the dialog so just to dismiss the to dismiss the message pop-up. Uh, pop okay, so resetting the game, we just need to reset some values. The game board, we need to just kind of create a new board. So, I'm actually just gonna copy the code from the beginning. And since it's a new game, the game over should be false and the current score should be back to zero. And let's create a new piece and finally start the game. Cool, so if I die, there's your score and play again and everything resets. Cool, and that is, that is it. We can actually come back to the pixel file now and let's get rid of this child. I don't wanna display the number anymore since we're finished. Let's get rid of this child. And this is the Tetris game. So hopefully you learned something. We created a Tetris game purely using Flutter and Dart. And by the way, this Dart game, if you look at the frame rate, as I mentioned at the beginning, is kind of the speed of the game. So you can use this number to speed up the game or slow the game down. If you made it this far into the tutorial, great job, really great job. Leave me a purple heart in the comments so I know. Also, if you have any questions about any of the code, leave a comment and I'll come around to help you out. So thanks for watching and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace.